So, ladies and gentlemen, it's a great pleasure to be here, and uh, thank you for the kind words of the Deputy Governor and our Chair Lady, and also my colleague, Dr. Aguirre. And um, I'm going to change the focus, actually, because we've had a lot of very big words tonight, and very big alphabet soup of FSN, FGU, I don't know, everything, all sorts of... All sorts of letters we've heard tonight and all sorts of aspirations for the new architecture. But I want to change the focus to what is the architecture, what is Europe doing at the moment to resolve the crisis of the Euro crisis? What's actually happening in practice? And I want to focus on Greece because I think Greece is a very important case study for what's happening in practice and it tells us a lot about why the Euro was the biggest disaster that ever befell the European Union. <laughs> I advised against this. Back in the 1990s, when Monsieur Delors was writing his wonderful report, I said, this is rubbish. This will destroy Europe. Just wait. And this is what it's doing. So I want to talk today about what it's doing to Greece and what we can do about that. So Greece is a very important problem. And as the last speaker said, Five years, Greece has suffered. <coughs> and uh, what are the Greek problems? Well, every time we're told there are supply-side problems. Everybody all over Europe tells Greece it should reform. Strong unions, you've got much too strong unions, you have cartels, you have restrictive regulations. Now, I know nothing about Greece. I'm not a Greek. I'm just telling you what people have told me you have to do, apparently. Lots of things, supply side. And you need to get productivity growth going and employment growth growing. So everyone telling you to reform. But the biggest problem in Europe is that all over Southern Europe, there's no demand. Complete lack of aggregate demand growth within the euro area. And indeed, the euro area is still really in recession. I mean, some statisticians say maybe it just came to an end. I don't know. In Greece, certainly still in recession. The growth in Europe is very low. And this is a euro-wide problem. And it's especially problematic in Greece, which isn't even having the quantitative easing program working in it. It's been exempted from the quantitative easing program so while the quantitative easing program is addressing the aggregate demand problem in the euro-wide area as best it can, it's not percolating to Greece. And the fundamental problem is that Greece is in the euro. <laughs> so the euro isn't working and Greece is a victim. What are the solutions to these problems? Well, yes. Greek supply-side reforms are necessary, and probably if Greece were to be show more, in, more enthusiasm for supply-side reform, you know, Hans Werner Zinn and other Germans, like uh, our friend here, Mr. Wurzel, Professor Wurzel, would be happier to, uh, to help out. And supply-side reforms need popular understanding. Many Greeks, I think, don't really understand what it's all about. They, they, don't, they don't get it. And I suppose the Karamanlis Institute, I don't know if I pronounced that right, because I always say Karamanlis, and I should say Karamanlis, I think. <laughs> anyway, the Karamanlis Institute has a role, it seems to me, an important role, in explaining the importance of supply-side reform. Okay, but then let's come to the other problem, which is... How can you reform if you no, there's no demand? I think this is a problem that the Deputy Governor referred to. Um, the ECB is doing quantitative easing, but, but uh, it needs to be done in Greece as well. And there's another problem. The central bank alone cannot really resolve the problem of aggregate demand if there's no fiscal policy. 
Now, there is no fiscal European policy, as my colleagues have pointed out. 1% of the budget is <coughs> the whole budgetary spending in the EU comes from the EU itself. The rest is national foreign, national governments. And they don't have fiscal policy to suit the EU. Fiscal policy, as, as, as Agnes Bernassi Query said at the beginning, is not symmetric, it's asymmetric. The policy towards it is it has an asymmetric bias towards deflation. And you know, until you solve that problem at the EU level, you cannot solve the problem of running a monetary union. This is the fundamental difficulty. This is why so many of the sort of awkward squad, like me, said you can't have a successful monetary union until you have some mechanism, called a state perhaps, that will solve the problem of fiscal policy. Because we know at the state level, if you have a fiscal policy that's inconsistent with the monetary policy, Fiscal policy will always win. It's called the fiscal theory of the price level. And fiscal policy, because it's run by governments, is the most powerful actor in the stage. And of course, monetary policy is subsidized, is funded by governments. Behind every central bank stands a government. So if you have a fiscal policy which doesn't support the banks, the central bank, the central bank will fail. This is an unfortunate problem. There's no fiscal policy in Europe, and that is a serious problem for, for the ECB. The ECB is doing its best. You know, it's like the pianist. Don't shoot him. He's doing his best. But he's making a horrible noise. Because it isn't, he isn't being supported by the orchestra. And the orchestra is fiscal policy. And of course, you know, we have all these grand proposals for architecture, there's a fundamental <coughs> problem with these proposals. Germany doesn't like them. Not one little bit does it like them. In Germany, the dominant idea is that macroeconomic demand management policy is a waste of time and probably mistaken and misguided in concept. And the object for fiscal policy should be the Schwarze Null. The Schwarze Null, the big black zero. This is the deficit target. Not fiscal policy, but always zero. Now, how can you have a collaborative fiscal policy at the European level when the major nation involved says they don't want it? I don't understand how. I don't think it can be done. Lots of words will be, will be spoken, lots of books will be written. Lots of reports will come out of the EU, and out of the Commission, and out of CEPs, and uh, Paris, and uh, Constance, and they won't have any effect because Germany doesn't want it. Now, I, I would like to say that, in spite of all this, I'm still optimistic about Greece. I want to talk now about Greece, and I want to compare Greece with the UK, because once we had lots of problems in the UK, we were called the sick man of Europe. It's a long time ago, 1970s. We were the sick man of Europe. We faced a lot of problems, many of them similar to Greece. Poor, uh, poor productivity, high unemployment, which reached 13%. 20% inflation, which is not a problem you have because you're in the Eurozone. What did we do? Well, you know, after the killing inflation by squeezing the economy, as you have to do, of course. That's a different story. What did we do? We had a lot of supply-side reform. You know, we liberalized the labor market. We had big bang in the city of London. You know, we let all the American banks into the city of London, creating a very competitive city of London. And uh, we, we, we dealt with the unions. You know, the unions have no power in Britain anymore. And in all this, that there was an Institute of Economic Affairs which kind of provided an intellectual role of education and support and explaining how these things worked. And I think this is an important thing to have, an institute that does this stuff, and that's why I support the Karamanlis Institute. But then the other thing, we had very stimulative demand policies. After 1981, when the, the inflation was defeated, <coughs> we stimulated the economy. How did we do it? 
We had tax cuts. Taxes were down by 5% of GDP in the 10-year period from 1982. Government spending was cut a little bit by 2% of GDP. So the net effect of fiscal policy is highly stimulated. And that's the way you get reforms to work, because when things are growing, people accept reforms. Because they say, OK, I'm going to have trouble. These reforms will inconvenience me in some way. But there's new industries growing. There's new jobs to be had. And that, of course, is how you get, as I say, people to accept supply-side reforms. M4 growth was fast. That's a little bit too fast. 11% a year over the same decade. It had to be reined back in 1990. Uh, you know? Well, that's a problem you'd like to have. Too much demand stimulating change. It's a problem you'd like to have in Greece. And I say that that's what you've got to do. So my message to the Greeks is stand up. Things are bad. You've been very badly treated. There's a lack of demand. There's a bad supply side. You're responsible for the bad supply side, but you can handle it. You're not responsible for the lack of demand. In the UK, the situation was nearly as bad. You need to do supply-side reform. The Karamanlis Institute needs to explain to people what it's all about. Why you can't have unions stopping everything happening. Why you can't have cartels that stop people entering professions, etc., etc. This needs to be explained to, to ordinary people. But then, this is the thing about this architecture. I would ask all these wonderful European economists that I have on the panel here with my colleagues, I would ask them, you know, what are you going to do about fiscal symmetry? Why is Greece excluded from QE? How long must this go on? What's going on here? Is this a punishment by the Germany for Greece being very naughty boys and girls? I don't know. What's going on here? Why is it the fiscal architecture doesn't work? The new architecture works for everybody, apparently, though it's not yet working at all. But it doesn't include Greece. I don't know. I say this. If these guys don't listen, everyone tells you it would be a, a disaster to, to go back to your own currency. But I would say this. In the UK, we didn't join the euro because we wanted to control our own currency and our own fiscal policy. Because it was important for supporting our objectives for the economy. If we hadn't had our own currency and our own fiscal policy, we would be in a terrible mess today. We'd probably be worse treated by Germany than Greece. You know, at the moment, we still have a deficit in the UK of 5% of GDP. Can you imagine? Why is that? Because to suddenly cut the economy to ribbons because of some objective to get back to balance makes no sense at all when you're in a crisis. So I say to you this. If Europe won't listen, leave the euro. Bring back the drachma and get order into your own monetary affairs and your own fiscal affairs because if they won't help you, you've got to help yourselves.